We have a lot to discuss today, so I'm just going to head and jump right in. I'm really excited to introduce our moderators for today. So I'll invite Christina Ishmael and Jeremy Rochelle on screen. Christina Ishmael is the Deputy Director of the Office of Educational Technology, and Jeremy Rochelle is the Executive Director of Learning Sciences Research at Digital Promise, and they're going to be leading our conversation today. So I'll go ahead over and pass it to them. Thanks so much, Gabrielle. Hello, everyone. It is so exciting to see these numbers keep going up as far as attendees that are here. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day and your busy schedules to join us for this webinar. We hope that one, that it will bring you some joy because that was what we were talking about in the green room before. Um, and that we get to have a little bit of fun as we talk about a subject that is quite important and continues to be um, the talk of, of many educators right now. And so I am grateful to be joined by my colleague, Jeremy Rochelle. It feels like just kind of like yesterday when we were doing this with our listening sessions last year that helped inform this report. So um, if you have not had the chance to check out the report, please do go visit us at tech.ed.gov slash AI, and then you will be able to see the report there as well as our core messages document that will give you kind of the highlights of the document itself if you don't want to read the full thing. Um, but maybe it's more enticing that we'll actually want you to go ahead and then read that. <laughs> Um, but we're very pleased to share this report that came out uh, towards the end of May and uh, everyone that has been involved in this process. So we hope that you do have the chance to go ahead and download it, read it, um, and then, of course, ask us some questions along the way. We do have the chat feature open. We also have the Q&A feature open so that you can ask questions throughout. And then please know that we will be fielding questions, I know undoubtedly, on our Twitter account at Office of Ed Tech and our LinkedIn as well. Um, so please go ahead and just let us know if you have questions, concerns, thoughts, anything like that. Um, we are happy to talk about that. So Jeremy, I'm gonna pass it on over to you, it looks like, um, to get us started or, nope, I'm gonna start this one, I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> this report is based on um, some longstanding research on AI in education since 1970. Um, while most folks think that AI is something new, we know that AI has actually been in schools since the 70s with intelligent tutoring systems and, and the like. And so we wanted to um, kind of obviously go back and, and learn from what uses have been in the classroom, as well as thinking about where we want them to go within the education sector specifically. So we brought together an expert panel pre-pandemic, which also seems very long ago, um, in early 2020 to look at how we would want to make sure that teachers are informed of this technology, how developers can get involved, and then what researchers are looking at as far as the research agenda and the questions. Then we moved into a landscape review to see the breadth and the depth of AI that was already being used in technology. And we kind of, we also helped parse that out there the use of AI in education versus the teaching of AI. So we do want to make sure that we kind of um, differentiate those two. And then the public listening sessions that I mentioned with Jeremy uh, last summer, late last summer, that helped inform this report. And all along, we've been working with the White House's Office for Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP, on their blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights that came out in October of 2022. If you've not checked that out, we'll make sure that you have the link to do that as well. But that is where all this work really starts, and we're so excited to be able to talk more about the report um, and our insights and recommendations moving forward. And now I get to pass it to you, Jeremy. Fantastic. Well, it's been just a great partnership, great uh, opportunity to support the U.S. Department of Education. So we at Digital Promise are all delighted to get to this point. You know, one of the things we really heard from you when we did those listening sessions is we need to demystify artificial intelligence. It's too mysterious, and that doesn't support us in education. So we looked for the simplest definition we can find, and that's an orange. AI works by finding associations in large data sets and inferring patterns, and then the other side, it automates something on the basis of those patterns that as they are discovered. And building on that definition, we can see there's two big shifts going on from, let's say, yesterday's ed tech use. Before, we might have used technology to organize and capture data, but we humans would always be inferring the patterns. 
But AI also suggests patterns. It recognizes patterns, maybe ones we haven't seen. And also, we've used ed tech to provide access to really cool instructional resources, but less so automating decisions about teaching and learning. And AI both looks for associations and it automates. And as these capabilities come onto the scene, we see things are just really accelerating, expanding, and they're creating both new opportunities and risks. And before we go on, I just want to say, I hope you've noticed in the report that the um, report is really trying to balance the sense of opportunity with the sense of, of risk, because we do see possibilities here to make education better if we remain aware of those risks. Next slide, please. We also, in de designing and developing this report with you, took care to notice that AI is not just one technology. There are some very popular technologies that you may all have been using recently, but AI is also robotics. It's also being able to listen to you speak in your natural voice and uh, answering your request. It's also a tool for planning and for scheduling and for optimization of logistics functions like the school bus, school lunches. So we want to be broadly aware that there are increases in capability in all these areas. It's not just one thing. And as educators who are concerned and promoting the future, we need to be aware of the whole range and not just focus on what's most prominent today. Go on to the next slide, please. And so throughout the report, which which uh, covers learning, it covers teaching, it covers assessment and research. We were trying to mine opportunities for where are those, where are those opportunities to improve education? And we came upon this list, there are a few others in the report. One is that AI enables us to interact differently with technology. We can speak, we can gesture, we can write prompts. We also have really leaned into throughout this report that educators are experiencing AI as a tool that can make their lives easier and also as a tool that can help them make better lesson plans, make better resources to serve their students, stimulate discussions. We have tuned into AI as a tool that can help us with equity goals, like addressing variability in student learning. And we've called for an asset-oriented recognition of students, not just finding their deficits or what they haven't learned yet. Miss, missing learning. AI supports more powerful forms of adaptivity we've seen and many kinds of feedback loops. Feedback is just so important in research and education and it can help us provide more and better feedback. Next slide, please. And we've also been very cognizant of how to name the risks. And to be clear, and this is really important for educational leaders, that this isn't just, or just, it isn't only, data privacy and security. You'll see data privacy and security are the third point here. But there are also broad concerns that AI should be safe for students and it should be effective. What we've learned about ed tech needing to have research showing it's effective still applies to AI. It shouldn't discriminate against students unjustly. Also, AI shouldn't be invisible. We have a right to know when AI is being used and how that might affect you as a teacher or as a student, or as a parent, or any role in our educational system. And you'll find throughout the report a lot about human in the loop. And one version of that is you need an ability to say, hey, this AI is not doing the right thing here. I want to opt out, and I want the attention of my teacher or another person to help resolve what's going on. And so these are five protections that we think deserve ongoing, broad consideration. Back over to you, Christina, to talk about this core metaphor in the report. <laughs> this has definitely been sticking with folks. And so I will read this word for word and then talk a little bit more about it. But we envision a technology enhanced future more like an electric bike and less like robot vacuums. On an electric bike, the human is fully aware and fully in control, but the burden is less and their effort is multiplied by the supporting technology. So I know that robot vacuums can actually be controversial because it maps out your house. So I do want to start by saying that, um, but robot vacuums are doing their own thing. They have already secured the perimeter of your home and then been able to do that. And they can operate individually and independently. 
So the e-bike, which I have to admit, I just put myself on an e-bike this past weekend during Pride Weekend in D.C. because I needed to get somewhere. And I was like, yes, it will amplify my efforts and get me there faster. But I was still in control. And so it really did make the metaphor <laughs> stick even more um, in the sense that, yeah, that's how we want to think about the use of AI within education. Jeremy, this this is really stuck. Are you hearing anything else as well? Yeah, we're we're definitely finding people find this e-bike really, metaphor really generative, and they keep proposing extensions to it as well. And we love to hear those. If you have a way you think of the e-bike, that would be a great thing to put in chat right now so we can learn more about how you're thinking about this metaphor. And let's go on to the next slide. So the report also has several of these tension graphics where we have some choice about how we proceed. And, and they're based on the research literature. You'll find that there's a lot of research cited in the report. One is about to what degree do we want teachers in control and when can teachers release some control? For example, to allow an automated tutoring system to support a student for extra hours, more than the teacher can provide. So there's this dimension of control. There's also a really important dimension that teachers are experiencing the opportunity to get customized assistance, for example, for making a lesson plan. But when they ask for that assistance, they're also giving up information about their intentions for a lesson plan. And that could have a, a dark downside of more teacher surveillance. And we're very concerned to articulate these tensions, bring them out into the public and have public discussion, debate, and, and action as to what we should do to manage some of these tensions that will occur. And I, I encourage you to look for all the tensions in the report. Speaking of tensions, the report builds towards this graphic. The, the small circles are generated section by section in the report, and then they're summarized by this graphic. And I'm not gonna read them all to you, but we want to point out that evaluating AI in education is not going to be a singular decision. It's not going to be just, is there evidence of uh, uh, efficacy? It's not just going to be, is it data privacy? Okay. We're going to have to think about multiple things. And the report really emphasizes the question of how are we centering our teachers and students? Not how are we centering the glory and the coolness of AI? How is this helping us? put teachers and students more at the center of the learning process. How does the system not only do data privacy and security, but we, we also have to do that. But just previously, I talked about the need for human overrides. How does it help inform a teacher about what's going on, why decisions are being made? How is it keeping people in the loop at all in all different ways? And the report covers different ways you could be in the loop from more planning to more real-time teaching in the classroom, to more broad adjustments of educational resources. And we recognize that AI will be integrated into other things. It, it won't be a complete teaching and learning or educational system on its own. And they're really important factors to how our educational systems are designed. So we need to be cognizant of that. And so this graphic is to remind us of how multi-layered this decision before us, these decisions will be. And Christina, I think, Perhaps we're on the last slide for this section. Yeah, absolutely. So you've heard how we've come to this report. Um, a lot of back and forth, a lot of writing and rewriting, and um, even having written a lot of this pre-chat GPT release in November. But we do know that the recommendations still stand. And we've gone back and, and had those conversations, not only with our colleagues here at the Department of Education, but also with Jeremy and his team and then our colleagues over at the White House, uh, the Office for Science and Technology Policy. So it really comes down to these seven recommendations for the use of AI in education. We definitely want to emphasize humans in the loop. We want to make sure that we are aligning the models to a shared vision for education. While this, this document itself really focuses on K-12 or, or P-12, we know that there are other instances and implementations and even considerations when it comes to higher education or adult education. And then we want to look at designing using modern learning principles. When we bring in these types of technologies, is it going to be a substitution similar to how we have sometimes approached ed tech? Um, or are we looking at the learning science and making sure that we are also addressing the greater pedagogy that is, that is in practice? 
prioritize strengthening trust with those developers, the people that are creating these types of technologies. Where are their data coming from? Having those conversations, which is something that the department is very keen on doing next. Informing and involving educators. Secretary Cardona said this the very first time whenever I presented the, all of the AI work that we were doing, saying, where are the educators and where are the educator voice in this? And I can say, we did these listening sessions with over 700 educators that were a part of that, and then additional interviews and surveys and things like that. So we will continue to inform and involve educators in this process. Then we look at our research and development on improving how AI addresses context. Some of you may know me from my work in open education, where we talk a lot about context and being able to customize for a local context. We also want to make sure that our research and development is taking this into account because a small rural district in my former state of Nebraska is very different than my colleagues in LA Unified. So we do want to make sure that we're looking at that local context. And then, of course, our favorite term or favorite phrase here at the department, guidelines and guardrails. And I can say it super fast now. I'm still going to get tongue tied. But developing guidelines and guardrails. What are those things that we can look at that we currently have within our authority? What are new authorities that we might need to potentially seek um, from either Congress or from executive action through the White House? And all of these things are helping drive kind of this next phase of work. So now. We get to welcome our panelists. <laughs> so first we have Kit Glazer, the principal from Mountain View High School and a fellow Pepperdine, Pepperdine wave. Uh, then we have Jim Laramore, the co-founder of EdSafe AI Alliance, Thomas Phillip, excuse me, a professor at UC Berkeley in the School of Education, working in those teacher prep programs, which are so important as part of this conversation. And then uh, Tammy Lind, who is a, te a technology integration coach at South Milwaukee School District in Wisconsin. Thank all four of you for being here and joining this conversation. Um, I want to go back to the recommendations and the insights that you know from the, uh, the report itself. I'm going to invite you to say hi. Um, and then what is something you found meaningful as you read this report or something that you want to see more engagement around? So I'm going to start with Kit first. Hello, everyone. Kit Glazer, Mountain View High School. Go Spartans. Uh, one of the things that I really appreciated about this team and all the other folks that I've worked with to get to this point is how thoughtful every level of conversation uh, has been and how much we talked about educators and the students in every single one of the conversations. And that's pretty much one of the main reasons why I pushed myself into this uh, topic, because so many times when you develop an ed education and technology or technology in general that is supposed to be used for the benefit of the students and educators, they're not in the room. And I so appreciate the team's conscientious effort in being uh, inclusive in that manner at every level. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Kat. Um, I'm going to go to, let's see, Tammy next. Sorry, you're on my screen next. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Tammy Lind, and I am uh, an instructional coach by way of special education. Um, and now I have to say go Rockets, Kip, since you gave a shout out. <laughs> um, I'm in South Milwaukee. Uh, and one of the things that that I really appreciate about the report is the timeliness of it. Um, we in in my area uh, are really just trying to grapple with the opportunities and the risks and figuring out where all of that's going to fall. And the report came out and it's providing us those bite sized chunks um, to have really deep conversations about how to impact, like you said, Kip kids and educators um, and to, to move forward in a really intentional, thoughtful manner. Um, and I, I appreciate just when it came out and, and how we can use it, so. Great, this is all very positive. We really appreciate it. We didn't pay them, I promise. Um, Thomas, can I go to you now? Hello everybody, my name is Thomas Phillip. I am a professor at the School of Education at UC Berkeley and also direct the uh, teacher education program. Again, it's a real pleasure to be here and to be in dialogue with all of you. Uh, what I appreciate most about the report was this consistent emphasis on AI with humans in the loop. Um, I, I really, really appreciate that, that framing. It was refreshing that from the beginning to the end, the report emphasized the importance of teachers, learners, parents, um, particularly retaining their agency to make 
decisions about what these patterns mean um, and to choose their course of action. So I feel like this quality conveys a deep, deep respect, not only for the expertise of educators, but also communities, particularly marginalized communities that are gonna be increasingly impacted by these AI technologies. So um, again, AI with humans in the loop is something that um, just found profoundly helpful. Thank you so much, Thomas. We're excited that we're starting to hear that used more commonly in the language too around AI. We're like, yes, we were on to something. We'll keep it. Uh, so Jim, we're gonna come to you, certainly not least, but last in this <laughs> order right now. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Christina. So I'm uh, Jim Laramore. I'm the co-founder and chair of the EdSafe AI Alliance, which is a global network of pre education practitioners, researchers, policy people, tech innovators, basically anyone who cares about education and technology and issues surrounding equity and fairness. Uh, so we, um, uh, would, for, for my colleagues and I in the alliance, as we read the uh, report, and in particular, as I read the report, there were really two things that I found uh, quite uh, quite striking. One is that there's enough detail that you provided a, a level playing field for people to get into the conversation together. Uh, and since uh, in our own professional kind of circles, we often have a particular jargon or dialogue that we're accustomed to, you, you gave us the com common language, right? So we can get into a conversation together. The second is that you really position this as the start of a dialogue rather than the middle or the end of a dialogue. And so, you know, uh, coming from uh, educational practice, I would say that one of the challenges that we sometimes encounter is that uh, we know that words matter and that uh, when we say things like teacher, classroom, engaged learner, uh, disengaged learner, uh, then we get images in our head. And so when we talk about a shared vision for education, it's important that we start at the beginning to talk about what we mean by that, because we don't all have the same images and ideas in our minds to start with. Thanks That's so great. much to all our panelists for your initial remarks. And now we want to go to a poll so that we can involve our attendees in just getting a word or phrase about how you're feeling today about AI and education. And we're going to make a little word cloud here with your input. And then our, our panelists will, as they see words appear, they're going to uh, to comment on some of the some of the words they see. And I think it's great that people are putting some right into chat. If, if you want to uh, put it into chat rather than type the poll. That's uh, it's great. And look at that. We're starting with optimistic. I love that that's the first word that's coming up so large. I have definitely been told that we are optimistic about, <laughs> about the use of AI in education. Well, yes, yes, because I think there are definitely some things for us to be looking for and, and um, be hopeful for. Oh, I also see hallucinations. Such a great word. I hope everyone knows it. When that generative AI makes a mistake, that is what we call it. I, as a former early childhood and elementary teacher, just think that we need to call all of our mistakes hallucinations now. Um, I think it would be hilarious. Any of our panelists notice a word they want to bring to our attention? Having trouble keeping track of the words as they as they move, but one word that I caught in between was the word responsible. Um, and to, um, I think a part of going back to the phrase "humans in the loop" uh, requires a responsibility on our part, and and, um, and really thinking about um, the the vision for for schooling, the vision for learning, and how we think about responsibility in relationship to AI. And I see overwhelmed, and I think some of our teachers and um, administrators over here at the end of the school year, we had many, many reports from our teachers about their uncertain evaluation of whether this particular essays were generated by their students or by AI, and where do they need to go? And if they were to quote unquote catch it, how how will this work? And then the number of inquiries were just overwhelming. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I was struck by the word pairing uh, between um, you know, excited and terrified uh, on this because I think it reflects what we read <laughs> in the news about AI and education or AI generally. Now, it's either the panacea; it's going to fix all of these longstanding social inequities, or it's going to kill us all. Right. 
<laughs> we hope the latter certainly isn't true. And we know from <laughs> lots of experience with research and ed tech implementation that the panacea isn't true either. Right. So I'm just glad to see excited still in the middle is the, you know, uh, I love the fact that I also saw the word empowered. I lost it now, but it was in there. Um, and I love the idea, as Thomas mentioned too, um, the report talks about having educators centered, you know, always centering our educators. And I think being excited and empowered is something that our educators really, as educators, we respond to that. And we, yes, we will proceed with caution, but we we respond to that empowerment um, and giving us that autonomy in our classroom to be able to do that. I love that this is settling in and we'll probably uh, begin to freeze it. I love that it's settling in unexcited in the middle with curious and cautious bracketing that because there's like this motivation to get engaged in the word excitement and this mix of we want to explore and we want to be careful. It just it just feels really right to me for broadly what we're hearing from educators. And by the way, educators, you are surprising people with how excited and curious you are. Like poll after poll is noticing this and people thought you know, the media predicted it was all going to be about fear. And uh, I think we've got to really follow the lead of our educators here and how they're approaching this topic. So I think we're going to we're going to freeze this now and let's go to some more panel discussion. And Christina, I think maybe you're going to kick that off with a, a question to our panelists. Oh, you're on mute. Yep, I wondered if I would do that, and we did. Okay, so as we talked about it already, uh, we have the insights that we identified as part of the listening sessions and then all the work on this so far, and then the recommendations. And so what we'd like to kind of highlight first are the insights. Um, the report identifies five insights, and we'd like to hear from our panelists how these insights um, resonate with each of their work. Um, so I'm going to start with backwards this time. So I'm going to start with Jim and then Thomas, you'll be up after that. Hey, uh, great. Thanks, Christina. Yeah, you know, for me, I think the uh, there are actually uh, two insights that um, grabbed my attention in part because I think they represent a tension area between what educators and students want and need and what the industry seems to be providing or what uh, the innovators uh, kind of in the ed tech industry uh, tend to zoom in on first, right? So I think the idea that uh, we can use AI to better support educators, whether that's through um, digital assistants or AI agents that can operate in the background and do things for you, uh, tee up some observations that you might then want to uh, question or confirm before you make decisions. I think was one. And the other is really how AI can help us detect some patterns that may be going on that are not so visible to us and better address learner variability, right? And I think those two things uh, for me uh, they represent what the hopeful picture is for how we can have technology help us rather than uh, be used as a substitute or a watered down version of what teachers, great teachers are, have always been able to do. And uh, and that's an area I think within the um, EdSafe Alliance that we're uh, zeroing in on as well as we think about the uh, twin guardrails of um, you know, kind of where we are and protecting room for innovation and at the same time protecting individual rights and kind of learner and teacher needs. Great, thank you, Jim. Thomas. Um, so reading this report as a teacher, a teacher educator and an educational researcher, I wanted to share one line that I felt made the most impact on me. And that was AI systems and tools must be inspectable, explainable and overridable. Educators will need support to exercise professional judgment and override AI models when necessary. And that to me, I think just captured a really important um, premise and, and commitment in AI, um, in, in educational uh, technologies as well, um, that emphasizes enhancing human judgment rather than in any way trying to replace it or limit it. And um, again, it's really about supporting teachers, learners, and parents to see classroom interactions in new ways and potentially new ways to see patterns or um, make sense of patterns that they might not have uh, made sense of before. And um, this, uh, I think those three commitments to being inspectable, explainable, and overridable really allows for AI that um, um, enables new forms of interactions in classrooms, 
right? Because it allows for new types of learning that might not have happened before, or for us to pay attention to those new forms of learning. But it also really supports teachers via these um, assistants or agents that really enhances their ability and their, their teacher judgment. Um, so, it, but I, I think it's really premised on the, those three commitments. And it looks like some folks are asking what that was again. So it was explain. In sorry, I'm gonna, inspect, yeah, inspect, explain, and override. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Tammy, we're coming to you. And you did mention at the top, um, you also come from a special education background. Are you thinking about the insights from that lens? I am. I am. And I'm, I'm so excited. Uh, I would be that big excited in the uh, word cloud that we did. <laughs> Um, just the whole idea of uh, using AI to level the playing field even more for our kids um, that may have IEPs or, or 504s or maybe just need that little additional customization as they're learning. Um, I think the other thing that really the report hit on that honestly I had not uh, thought through is the whole idea of customization and looking at kids from a strength-based model. And one of the things as a, as a special educator, how do we write our IEPs? You know, we look at the gaps, right? What gaps do we have to fill? Um, and I'm so excited that using AI, kids will have the ability to really customize uh, at their level. You know, there will of course be teaching and learning that will need to take place previous to that, but we're going to be able to allow students to access and build on their own strengths um, and really come at our teaching and learning from a strength-based model. And I think that to me supersedes all of the excitement about assistive technologies and things and just looking at it from, from a positive instead of a fill in all of the things that are wrong. Um, and so that's really the, the report hit on that multiple times in the insights. And so that's really where I landed as my excitement. I, I love great. that, Tammy, that you picked up on that, because when we were reviewing all the literature in preparation for this, you know, one thing we found is we've been through a lot of personalized learning, but when you read what it was doing, it was finding what the student did wrong and trying to patch that hole so they could get back on course. And it was very rare to find anything that acknowledged that learners are bringing an undiscovered strength to the table. And could we support that strength by letting them speak to a technology, by letting them gesture instead of drawing? Uh, there's so many new ways. And we're, we're hearing those stories roll in from educators on how this is giving them new ways to support their students and perhaps also less time writing plans and more time creating resources for students, because we still have to write those plans, uh, yeah. they still have to be developed, but wh where are we putting our effort? And if we can get educators closer to the students, that just seems so important. I would, I would also say that we've had several conversations with folks who design IEP tools and solutions and how they're thinking about AI to help with responses um, mm -hmm. for, helping develop those goals for our students with disabilities. The same for our EL or our multilingual learners. Um, we all have the goals that we set for each of our learners there when it comes to their language um, proficiency. And so it's important to be able to, to do that as well. So, okay, Kip, on to you, insights. So everyone says so many good things that I would uh, want to say. And I'm gonna add to the idea that even though teachers work over 50 hours a week, 49% of their time is spent actually working directly with kids. And if I were to get excited, I am excited about AI, how do we expand that time? Because since the pandemic returning to school, our children are crying out for help. And we talk a lot about social emotional learning. And I think bottom line, we really need that human connection. That's why Zoom school really didn't work. And, and teachers want it too, right? And if they're not able to provide that less than 50% of their time is actually spent working directly with the students, no educator goes into education system wanting to do that. We want more time with our students. And what are some opportunities that uh, the AI development provides that will allow us to do that is where I would like to learn more about and spend more time in um, 
looking into. That's great, thank you. Um, we are now going to shift, you heard from the insights and how our panelists think about those insights. Now we're going to look at the recommendations that we put forward. There are seven recommendations. Again, I'm gonna drop these in the chat, starting with emphasizing humans in the loop all the way down to those guidelines of guardrails. Um, and so I would love, I'm gonna start with you, Kit, this time. We're just gonna go back in that order. Um, I know, just, you know, it keeps it nice and easy. It's predictable, right? Um, so, Kip, what would you like to see as far as the recommendations are concerned? Do you feel like these encapsulate um, kind of what you're hoping to see within the use of AI in education? Do you think there's some more that we should focus on, less? What, what are your thoughts on that? So, I think because this is such a big and complex topic, you can always put more in. And so, but it sometimes it just less is better. And I think two things, if I could shrink this down to like a couple things so I can think about how I'm going to do this at my site because boots on the ground is really centering the humans in the loop, like whether it's student, parent or educators, like this is a tool that we should not cede our agency to, right? Like it needs to be under our Control is not the necessarily the word I'm looking for, but like supervision might be a good, better word, right? And that's really what I'm thinking about. And it really has to have that best practice, best research base. Because so many times in education, uh, we get excited about something, the shiny tool effect, right? Like, and then we really don't sometimes get an opportunity to really slow down and say, is this really best uh, based on learning science and best practice. And I uh, always think about if we could hire or we could have the learning scientists helping us develop all these things at every school district, every school site, every classroom, how much better could we serve our students? And if I can't do that as a person, perhaps AI will give me that opportunity to do that because uh, we wanna do what's best for our kids and we don't have a whole lot of time. I only get them for four years. so. I'm I'm really, really excited about doing that. That's great. Thank you so much, Kip. Tammy? Well, Kip took mine, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, but humans in the loop, we've got that, right? We realize, we recognize that's a, that is a, a huge deal. Um, one of the recommendations that I really appreciate is the whole recommendation of involving and uh, informing educators. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, we don't have the right people at the table. And so I want to make sure that mm -hmm. our educators are at the table and involved, not just at this part, but involved in the creation of AI resources and, and educators and students doing the co-designing of all of this. Um, I just, I love that you made that recommendation because I think sometimes that that just gets a little bit forgotten that we need to make sure we've got our educators around the table and our students around the table and we are designing together moving forward together absolutely and with that uh, tammy i just want to also give a shout out there's lots of organizations developing resources trainings materials they're really stepping it up we're seeing and that's going to be so important because that can no one source can possibly do all we need to do to inform, involve our educators. It has to be all of us working with what resources we have to, to make that possible. And it's, it's gonna take some effort to, to get everyone involved in the way we want them to. We can't just sit back and say, it's gonna happen. So I really appreciate you calling that out. Yeah. Thomas? So the, one of the recommendations that really spoke to me was um, seek AI models aligned to a vision for learning. And for us to be clear of what do we want our classrooms to look like? What do we want our students to learn? How should they feel in those spaces? And if and how AI fits into that space. So we're really centering a vision of learning and not adapting technologies or adopting technologies simply because they're available. Um, and again, uh, within this AI context, um, it's the center, uh, the intersections of technology and profit oftentimes can uh, move learning in a direction that is not necessarily what we would hope for. So, and there are then times for us to be comfortable to say that AI is not the appropriate solution. And mm -hmm. so knowing when not to use AI is just as important. 
Um, so many of, many of much of what we deal with in classrooms, what we engage with is deeply relational questions. Um, they're not necessarily just technical problems. And so how do we center the, the relational? Um, just briefly wanted to mention some of the work that I've been doing um, on, on a larger AI institute um, funded by the NSF is working with young people, um, thinking about their hopes, fears, and dreams with AI. And what comes back clearly is ultimately they want classrooms that are caring. They want to have classrooms where they are curious, where they can be passionate, where they can be joyful. Um, and so how do we also center these, these, um, these values or these qualities? And oftentimes in, in, in the AI space, it's about um, narrowing learning to support a particular trajectory of, of learning without recognizing the value of confusion. It's important <laughs> for people to appreciate, um, experience confusion and experience uh, forms of frustration even in, in productive ways. And yes. these are deeply, deeply relational questions. Um, so I really just appreciate that uh, recommendation of aligning AI models to a particular or to visions of learning. We appreciate that, Thomas. I think that that also goes back and supports the the additional work that we're doing here, even at the Office of Ed Tech, where we've framed everything through digital equity and opportunity um, because the bipartisan infrastructure law that President Biden signed in November of 2021 codified in law the first time an actual definition of digital equity and digital inclusion. And part of that digital inclusion is access to connectivity and devices. It's also access to instructional materials, which we have expanded to instructional models as well, because we don't want to run into that substitution that we've seen with EdTech for so long, but it's really changing practice. I've seen over here in the chat too, like learning comes first, the tool comes second. The right. same thing here. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm so happy to hear that this is resonating. Jim, back to you. I'm okay, sure. Well, I'm, I'm glad for your final comment because I think you're synthesizing some like really important information, right? Which is we have to get our intentions straight and figure out what issue or problem we're trying to um, solve for. And AI, I think, and this is in, uh, embedded in some of um, Thomas's comments as well. Uh, AI is optimized for something, and it's usually for speed, not for uh, true learning, right? Not for someone to have a mastery over content. So finding the right tools or figuring out whether the tool is appropriate for the thing that you're trying to do is very important. Uh, for me, I, I focused on this uh, based on I could hear the, you know, I basically I could hear the voices of some of my grad school uh, professors saying that um, you know good research begins with good design. And what we're really talking about is a research and development ecosystem to support this very complex undertaking of um, how we educate our country's young people or people of any age, you know, for that matter. And so I think figuring out uh, how we define the research question and um, and make sure that we're looking at something and understanding whether we're in exploration and discovery mode or whether we're taking something out that we feel we have some evidence for and we're testing it with a broader set of, of audiences or kind of use cases or contexts, or whether we have something that is ready for prime time um, on a very broad scale, right? We, uh, we cannot afford to operate within these functional silos that we've inherited. And uh, one of the things that I'm uh, kind of feeling hopeful about both from the report and, uh, and you know, Christina and Jeremy from the way that you put today's session together, is that I feel like if we have an, um, a group of people who care about education, work in education, who uh, feel a sense of agency, we can define a different reality than the one that we've inherited, right? We can um, position educators to function more like the research scientists um, a generation ago who got people to the moon and back rather than to be the technicians being trained to go watch a robot on an assembly line, right? And I think we have a fundamental choice to make there and I think where we have a voice, we should use it. Thanks so much to our panel for really informing and enlightening our view of some key lessons in this report. It feels like you've really drawn out some central messages. And I also just appreciate the conversation that we're seeing in the chat. It seems like just such an intelligent conversation happening there. We couldn't have hoped for better in launching this webinar to have both things going on simultaneously. And just to say, you know, the team of us that are working to digest this and, and support the recommendations going forward, we'll look at the chat and take in some of your questions that you are providing. And what we wanna do now is many of you asked questions when you registered for the webinar. 
And so what we've done is put a couple of those on slides and we're gonna just address some of the things that you said you wanted to know going forward. And the first one's for Christina. Christina, how will the Department of Education work on the recommendation to develop better guidelines and, and get guardrails? Oh, if only I had a nickel for this question. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a great question, and I think where we are trying to start the conversation right now is to look at our existing authorities within the U.S. Department of Education. While I can say that we represent the entire country, all of its territories, and many of its tribes, um, we also recognize and, and certainly want to prioritize local control. And so it's important for us to, similar to like the tensions that you've seen in the report, it's also a similar situation here within the US Department of Education, making sure that we are looking at things comprehensively, but then also allowing for that local control. And so this goes back to some of the, the current authorities that we could start to look at, whether it's our grants. Um, and so we have competitive grants here at the US Department of Education. Um, that we could look at as far as the grant priorities themselves. We have the Office for Civil Rights, and we can certainly um, consult with them to see how AI is being used within education, make sure that no civil rights are being violated in that process. So there are many ways for us to engage and um, think about that within our current authorities, and then explore the ways that we can look at new authorities and what that would take. Because for the most part, that actually requires our folks up on, on the hill, quite literally up the street on the hill to make those recommendations for us to be able to do that um, and then uh, be able to then put that into practice and make sure that we have, again, all of the different voice that, voices that are represented right now. So I think there's more to, be, to come, of course. Um, for the immediate next steps, we are going to really focus on our ed tech developers specifically because we want to engage them in that conversation. How are you thinking about the safety, the responsibility, student data privacy, all of this when you are designing with AI? Should we go to the next question? Aha, yes. Jeremy, this one's for you. So what are the key tenants to trust when it comes to AI and education? Are there key distinctions between or beyond data privacy that need to be drawn between trust um, when we use it in higher ed versus K-12? Yeah, absolutely, Christina. Trust is super important. It's what we hear consistently when we do these listening sessions. And while data privacy and security remain rock bottom important, there's more going on. And so we would be remiss if we didn't bring up problems of algorithmic bias that can occur. And if people are feeling that a system may be biased towards them or towards someone they care about, that would undermine trust. And so we yeah. really have to get much more sophisticated about issues of fairness and bias. And we can look to our assessment community who, who has always had to worry about these issues for support in how to do it. Uh, the, the words that our panelists threw out earlier are the opposites to that. Can we understand how the system behaves? Can we inspect it? Is it explainable? Can we override and control? Those will contribute to trust. So I think a key message is to get to trust. We're gonna to have to keep building on what we were already doing with data privacy and security. And there's some new issues that are gonna to have yeah. to come to the fore. Yeah. And let's go to the sure. next question, which I'm gonna ask Christina. Can you say more about why equity figures so strongly in the department's perspective on, I, on AI? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would like to like zoom out of just the perspective on AI, but really looking at the administration as well as our agency more specifically. So um, equity has been at the heart of the Biden-Harris administration um, since day one, when President Biden signed a few executive orders around racial equity specifically, around equity within government agencies. And so we have taken that to heart. Secretary Cardona has certainly elevated and amplified and kind of focused that across all of our priorities within the department and raising the bar um, so that we can lead the world. And, and that looks different in each of these instances. But within AI, we do want to think about equity here. And it goes back to, the, to what I had mentioned as far as the digital equity, too. We don't want to find ourselves in another situation pre-pandemic where we recognize that it was very inequitable as far as access, whether it was devices, connectivity, digital resources, um, digital literacy, whatever that case may be. 
um, we always want to lead with equity. And so we're making sure that this does not become another digital divide or digital equity um, kind of scenario. And so the, the more that we can center those conversations around, we're providing equitable access and opportunities to every learner. And I use the word every. This is something that I learned with some of our philanthropy colleagues. They use the term every instead of all because you can actually see an individual child when you use the word every versus all, which feels much more blanketed. And so mm -hmm. I think even something as small as language, which we talked about already being super important, we have to think about every learner and making sure that we have equitable access and opportunities. Let's go I to the think next one. We're going to skip one here just to stay okay. on time. We've covered this a lot. So okay. let's go to let's go to one more. And you're going to read this one to me, I think. Okay. What do you see going forward in terms of change in instruction and assessment as a result of new technology like generative AI and ChatGPT, Bard, insert any other generative AI? <laughs> yeah. So this question came, you see it a lot in the chat of this webinar as well and people thinking about problems of plagiarism that they're worried about, thinking about will our assessments remain valid? This is a, a big discourse we need to have, and it has to start with what do we really care about? Um, you know, I've looked a lot at the portrait of a graduate exercise that many school districts and their communities commit to, and none of them so far have said what we really care about in our graduates is a great five uh, paragraph college essay. Like that's a proxy for something. And we need to get really clear about what we care about. And then I see we actually, assessment has developed a lot. There's a lot known, there's a lot we can build on once we're clear on our goals. And I see some of the people in the chat today just celebrating that now is a time where processes and performance assessment can come more to the fore. And others, of course, we saw those words, those emotions in our word cloud in the beginning, like this is overwhelming. And we need to pay attention to both of those. Um, this really will challenge how we do instruction and assessment. It's happening in higher ed quite a lot already, mm -hmm. but it, it'll affect it all. And so, you know, we don't have an answer here. We just wanna highlight how important this conversation is and that we bring all parties involved, everyone, who's developed something they can really shape this conversation into the yeah. conversation. Go ahead, Christine. Jeremy, I had a, I had a specific example of um, kind of the human in the loop and, and use of generative AI that I'd love to share with you too. Um, so two weekends ago, I was at an event, Women in Leadership, Education Leadership event, and I have permission to share this story, but um, uh, a daughter of one of the speakers there who is a second grade teacher in the Midwest said that they were able to use generative AI to draft a letter to the, the students and the families of her students after one of her students unexpectedly lost a parent. So I previously taught second grade. Um, I've also lost a parent. I've lost my father right after high school. And I cannot even imagine like the emotions going through that teacher's head at that time. But they were able to use something like ChatGPT to draft that letter. And instead of spending the time doing so, they were then able to work one on one with the student who had lost their parent. And I just there's so much power in that story because I again, it talks about the human in the loop. It talks about the easing up some of the burden on teachers, which we know we continue to throw things more things on the plate, but not necessarily take those away. And so I think that it's just something that we have to think about some of these promising practices. Um, when we talk about not only instruction, but what it's going to look like in classroom. Let's go to our next question, Christina. What is the department seeing in terms of how it wants to collaborate with all the people who have kindly joined us today? <laughs> I know. I'm like, I don't know if we have room for a thousand of you to come hang out with us at the Department of Ed, but well, we are a service agency, as the secretary and the deputy secretary reminds us every single day. Um, so this is your Department of Education. If you're ever in D.C., let us know. But um, we are going to, of course, have further um, kind of listening sessions. We want to hear from educators, from educational leaders specifically, as we think about those seven recommendations, how can we develop further kind of um, supporting resources for you all. Would it look great if or if we created some professional learning resources? Would would it help to unpack 
some of the language that's used within those recommendations in a specific module. We've, we've got options. Um, we also have a, a finite period of time, honestly. Like we have to operate under the assumption that we've got 15 months remaining in our tenure and like we got, we got stuff to do. And so we would love to be able to tap the expertise that you all bring into this space and, and learn alongside and learn from you. So stay connected with whatever you Please. are organizing <laughs> and doing. Share, put it out there because we definitely need everyone activated on these issues. And so we're going to just invite our panelists back to the screen and give them an opportunity with, to share a closing thought. Here are some of the things we'll be doing going forward, but let's go to our panelists. Given the breadth of the conversation today, what I would love to see us work on is a holistic plan with public and private support uh, for the kind of teacher professional development and engagement that we need kind of from start to finish across the continuum of how AI can be used effectively in education. Great. Thank you so much, Jim. I think my my big ask is that we continue to, to keep educators and students at the forefront of these conversations. And really, I love the idea of the holistic plan moving forward. And let's really have educators, kids, uh, companies co-designing as we move forward and, and keeping that. And, and the humans in the loop, you know, that, that will resonate with me for a long time. Absolutely. Thank you, Tammy. Human-centered policy. What a concept. <laughs> Kit, Thomas, anything that you want to close us out with? So from a practical perspective, I agree with everything that everyone has been saying. Um, and the person who is in charge of administrating policy, I do believe that the school board needs to also be part of this conversation especially in my local context. Um, the first question I ask is what does the board policy say and what is the AR interpretation of that? And, and I think the, the middle people have to be involved in all of this decision-making so that when it shows up in the classroom that we can allow all these great recommendations to come to light. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kip. Thank you for keeping it real. We appreciate that. We often, I mean, like, it's true. I'm I'm part of the teachers at ed group that works here at the department as a former classroom teacher and a practitioner. And it's so important, but we also have to stay connected to those that are still in the classroom. And so, and helping make those decisions and supporting boards and all of that. So that makes perfect sense. Um, all right, Thomas. I think the three words that are st um, sticking with me closely are the words intentional, responsible, mm. and equitable. Mm. Wow, what great words to go out on. I love that, Thomas. Thanks so much. You know, many people are asking in the chat, will the slides be, be available? They will. And also, um, we support the department in taking the video of this and making that available. So give us a few days but uh, the materials from this will, will be available. Uh, there's some thoughts about chat, because the chat was so rich, and we'll look into what we can do with the chat um, as well. Uh, so, um, Christina, take us out. Well, once again, I just want to say thank you. Um, it was a really fast hour, so <laughs> um, we should we should always know to expect and accept the lack of closure, which is where we find ourselves here again. Um, but thank you so much. We do hope that you check out um, tech.ed.gov slash AI to learn more. Um, stay engaged with us. Uh, I will be at ISTE. I saw someone said, let's keep this conversation going at ISTE. Um, I will be in Philadelphia at the end of the month, so would love to be able to kind of check in with folks on the ground, quite literally. So thank you all so much for your participation today and have a great rest of your week.